listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY Musician Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 156 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin Bruner, your host for the show, and today we're going to hear from Annie Lynn from Louder about how to properly license your cover songs. Before we get to my interview with Annie, I just want to remind you that it's that time of year. The holidays are upon us, and there is no better time to get your music out to the world and have it distributed worldwide than now. This is the time of year people are getting gift cards for Christmas. They're going to go to Amazon and look for music. They're going to go to Apple Music and iTunes and all sorts of other places. They're going to be creating playlists on Spotify and all the other streaming services, and your music needs to be there. We talk about moving your career forward a lot on this podcast and making money from your music And the first thing you got to do to make money from your music is make sure it's everywhere your fans are looking for music and want to find you and and play your music. So go over to members.cdbaby.com. There's still plenty of time to get your music signed up for worldwide distribution before the holidays. So do that right now because time is running out. So again, members.cdbaby.com. And uh, here's to a, a happy 2015 holiday season. And speaking of the holidays, one way that artists like to try and get the attention of their fans during the holiday seasons is doing a cover song or a single of a holiday track. And it's important to understand how to properly license those songs. Cover songs are one of the best ways to get the attention of fans, break through, create new fans, get people interested in what you're doing. It happens on YouTube all the time. We see artists doing very interesting and cool cover songs Uh, that really build their fan base and and drive people into wanting to know more about their original music. But you got to know how to do it legally. So in this episode, I talked to Annie Lynn from Louder. Louder is a licensing company and uh, that uh, we're good friends with and we think you should check out. But uh, Annie's going to help us understand all the things you need to know about doing cover songs and how to take care of licensing them properly. So here's my interview with Annie. Annie. Well, joining me on the line is Annie Lynn. Annie is the senior counsel at Louder. Annie, how you doing? I'm doing great. I don't know that I ever officially thanked you for uh, saving me from the the deer in the headlights look at South by Southwest trying to figure out how to use the whole fast pass uh, system to get a gig. I don't know if you remember, but you actually yes, I, you, I, you walked me through that process, and I I was feeling very overwhelmed. <laughs> Glad to. <laughs> South by Southwest is a thing that I've gone to since like 2004 or 2006, um, almost every year, both, you know, initially as an artist and then, you know, for business. So it's happy to help. So, um, so you're the senior counsel at Louder and, and, but you're a musician as well. And, and, uh, and we're going to be discussing cover song licensing. So let's just, uh, tell us about yourself. Who is Annie Lynn? <laughs> um, so, you know, I actually, I actually got into this whole crazy music business because many, many years ago, um, I was a touring singer songwriter. I discovered the guitar when I was in college and I started to play open mics and then I started to play shows and then, um, you know, I recorded a demo and it got reviewed and then I started to play more shows and, I fell in love with it. I was really, uh, really very passionate about it. And so I started uh, touring as a singer songwriter and putting out records um, through CD Baby, actually. That's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, I really, you know, when you are an independent musician, at least in my experience of being an independent musician, um, I want to say like, it felt like 80% of it was business. You know, Mm -hmm. when I was actually heavily doing this and doing this full time, it was 80% of it was business and 20% of it was creative and had to do the business in order to have the creative. But I actually was one of those those musicians that really love, love the business part of it. So, um, I, uh, you know, one point later I decided to fully cross over and I, I went to law school, went back to law school and, um, 
studied intellectual property, entertainment law, took that whole track. And when I came out, um, I fulfilled a promise that I made to myself a long time ago and I moved to New York and, um, and started working in the music business. So, um, I joined a company called the orchard, um, which you're familiar with. Yes. Um, and I was their licensing director and, um, uh, then after that, eventually I moved back out to the West coast where I'm originally from. Um, I worked as a music supervisor for film and television for a while. Um, and then Eventually, I went into private practice as an attorney, um, working um, with music startups, um, film production companies, and um, and some artists, mainly artists that I was really passionate about. And um, basically, one of Louder was one of my clients, and they asked me if I would like to to join them and work in house. And I was I've we've always been really intrigued by and excited by what they're doing because I, I love working in music rights. That's been my focus all along for the last decade. So, um, so I said, yes. And, uh, and that was, that was two years ago. So that's where I've been. Wow. So you said you had a, a brief period as a music supervisor. Where, uh, where are you a music supervisor at? I was working at a company called the rights workshop and they're, they're a small company that does music supervision and licensing here in San Francisco. So a lot of films, um, some television, a lot of independent films. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, cover song licensing. Uh, it's a question we get at CD Baby all the time about recording covers, what rights uh, are involved. And, it, it, and we can even talk a little bit about... Uh, um, some sync licensing stuff if we have time to, but I really want to hit on the cover song licensing aspect of it. Um, it seems like that as we've moved into the digital age that there's a lot of gray area, more gray area than there already was around cover song licensing and what rights you need to secure to release your music. So um, let's let's just start from the beginning and talk about uh, in, in what cases do you need to go secure a license for uh, a song you record? So if you're recording a song that you didn't write and that, or that, and that you don't own or for some reason one way or another control the rights to, um, you're, you're going to need to get a license. So I'm going to back up a little tiny bit. Um, and sort of outline the, the way that music rights work, especially as they relate to um, cover songs. When you, um, when you have a piece of music um, that's recorded, you have two different rights, actually. You have the right to the recording, which is that particular recording um, of a song, and then you have the right to the underlying song itself, Okay. Um, the right to the underlying song itself is also known as the publishing. Um, it's also sometimes known as the quote sync, even though that's kind of confusing because sync also means other things. It can be, it can also be called the composition, but basically the song itself, the composition, the publishing consists of the words, you know, the song structure, the melody, all of those things, which make a song a song. And those are, those comprise a separate right from a particular recording of a song. So say, for example, um, you record, um, you know, a Smokey Robinson song. Well, whoever owns Smokey Robinson's publishing for that song will own the publishing for the, will own the song itself, will own the publishing and you will own your particular recording. Just as if I were to go off and record my own version of that song, um, I would own my version of the song, but I wouldn't own the song itself. The publisher would still own the song. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I, th I, th I think so. I, I'm following you. <laughs> yes, I, th I think that makes perfect sense. Um, I think a lot of our artists that are listening to this, it, it would probably be in that scenario that you mentioned. They're, they're finding songs to cover, uh, it's a favorite artist of theirs. They've always wanted to do their version of it. They go, they pay for studio time, they record it themselves and they go and they want to just put it on iTunes. And, and then that's when they kind of run into the whole, 
hey, wait a minute, you should have a, a license, a mechanical license to sell this. And a lot of people are like, what? I, this is my version of the song. And I think, I think what you outlined there is clear that, okay, someone else owns this song, so f- I clearly have to compensate them, but then what, what do I compensate them for? So I like to think of copyright. Um, I like to, I, I teach a copyright class um, at the Academy of Art University, and I, I like to compare copyright to a six-bedroom Victorian house Victorian because we're I I have never heard copyright explanation go in this direction before I'm very intrigued it's a six six bedroom house okay when you own a house what can you do with the house you can sell the house to somebody else but you can also rent out the room to somebody else you can you can let somebody stay there you can Airbnb the house you still let somebody stay there for one night okay yeah you can maybe let someone sit on the porch of the house for a while and sell lemonade there's a lot of different things that you can do with that house that's real property So copyright is intellectual property. So it's like the house, except it's not actually a physical thing. And because it's not a physical thing, you know, you instead of, you know, just as you would be able to uh, lease out a room of your house um, to somebody, you can license out the right to your copy to use your copyright to somebody. And because it's not a physical thing, you can do it multiple times. So say, for example, you are the publisher of Katy Perry's Roar. Actually, there's multiple publishers there, but if you are one of the publishers for Katy Perry's Roar, you can you can give lots of people the right to record cover songs, um, cover versions of that song. You can also license out that song to lots of different television shows and movies and advertisements. Um, a license is allowing is giving someone permission to use your rights. And so when you are an artist and you are covering a song, you are recording a cover song and the cover song is, you know, this def- by definition is the you're recording somebody else's song. If the rights are controlled by somebody else, you know, it's, it, you are essentially stepping into a room in their house and you need to have their permission in order to be able to do that. You need to be able to, you need to have their permission to use their intellectual property or get the rights. So that's, um, I hope that analogy helps to clarify things. I've always really liked it because it's, it's has a San Francisco flavor. What was the the Bay windows? (laughs) Uh, so from that point, I know I need to get the rights. Um, and I know louder is, is a the company you work for is a mechanic is a licensing company. Um, so when I go to someone like you guys and I what what am I looking for? Because I'm say I'm gonna I the common scenario I see artists doing is like okay they'll get you know 500 copies of a CD or a thousand copies of a CD uh, they'll put it up on iTunes it'll be on streaming services and um, a lot of times. Uh, they'll go to a site like yours, get, oh, well, I've printed a thousand CDs, pay the mechanicals, and I'm done, right? That's all I got to do. I, I made a thousand CDs, I paid for those mechanicals, I'm done. But that's not really correct. Right. So um, I will tell you that um, the government has actually set forth laws in the copyright, in the copyright laws, rules in the copyright laws that, um, actually establish a system, a system, a system for licensing cover songs and essentially for making copies, um, of a song in the form of a recording. Um, and the reason why this exists, it's, it's standardized. The reason why it's standardized is that the idea is that somebody, if somebody has released a song in the United States, whether as a digital download or, you know, as a CD or a vinyl or what have you, if they've released it and they've put it into the commerce stream, you know, you don't want to prevent other people from being able to sing the song and maybe record the song. So there's actually, um, there is actually a system in place um, where there are set fees for cover song licensing. So, um, you know, if you wanted to, for example, uh, sell a piece of vinyl with a cover song on it or a digital download or, you know, a CD, it's going to be nine cents 
per copy per cover song that you that you um that you put out there so um it's because of the fact that these rates are set it's great because you know you know what you're getting but at the same time these rates are set and so if you as an artist are putting out a record um you need to get a cover song license um get that permission basically. And, um, and then you also need to pay royalties based on the number of copies that you've pressed. But of course, you know, in the digital world, as you mentioned, the digital world, like, you know, it, it, it's not a pressing plant. It's actually, you know, could have, you, you could purchase a certain number of, um, you could purchase, pay a certain number of royalties based on the amount that you think you're going to sell, but you might sell more than that. And if you sell more than that, um, you do need to pay those royalties. The songwriters need to be compensated for those uses. Well, I think that's that's the one area, as we've moved into the digital world, where it's become confusing for artists is that uh, you have, you know, like I mentioned, in the CD world, it's like I got a thousand CDs made, I made a thousand copies of my cover song, I pay nine cents per CD. Here we go. I'm done. I paid it. We're all good. I can do whatever I want with these CDs. In the digital world, it gets a little more confusing because one, it's a separate format. So you, your what you paid for your CDs doesn't cover what your downloads. Right. Exactly. And then also, um, you know, I think that just, I mean, the internet was around, but it's definitely not where it is today when I was making music. And I got to tell you that, you know, it's so easy now to um, make your music available, you know, and you, you have, you can give your music away on platforms like SoundCloud. You can, you know, you can inexpensively order a quick run batch of vinyl if you want to. Like there's, there's, there's so many ways to get your music out there and to, to offer people copies of your music, whether for free or for money or, you know, as part of a promotion, there's a variety of ways. And I think what gets lost in the midst of all of that, um, is the fact that when you do, when you do offer, offer up copies of your cover song, which of course includes, you know, is a cover of someone else, someone else's song, a song whose rights are owned by somebody else. Um, that is still using that, that you are still, using that license and that song still needs to be licensed and you still need to pay those rights. Those royalties are still owed. So if you give away 500 songs, you know, you, you might be willing to take the hit and say, okay, well, this is, this is what I'm going to do to market myself. But you know, the songwriters didn't have a say in that decision. You know, like they, you still need to pay them a royalty for, for those copies. I think that's a good point that you just made. Uh, that specifically that the songwriter didn't have a say in that decision. So I know a lot of people will say, Oh, I'm giving it away. So it's fair use or it's promotional. So I don't have to pay. And, um, but the songwriter didn't have any say in your decision to give it away. And so that shouldn't be dependent on whether or not they make money. Yeah, it's not fair use. Um, do not get me started on fair use. <laughs> well, I have you, an entire class on fair use, and you know we might have to have you back again for for that yeah. topic because it's it's funny how many different uh, ways I see artists attaching the term fair use on you know what what they basically are using is just promotional copies. Yeah, um, that term is is thrown around a lot, and, it, and it's dangerous. So it's it's really important important to understand and it's hard to understand what fair use is because it is by definition very subjective so but but even with even though it's subjective there are still rules and there are still some things that are very clearly not fair use so giving away cover versions of you know your you know giving away free cover songs of someone else's song that is not fair use um so i'm i'm an artist i got my cds licensed i've gone and purchased, uh, you know, estimated how many digital downloads I think I'll sell off my new album and and got that all taken care of with a license. But moving into the territory that, that, that you just mentioned, I think that's where 
it feels like as an artist, I just need to throw my hands up and go, hey, you guys got to work out a system. You guys, meaning the the industry at large or, or the powers that be, in order for me to really start being able to uh, track like giveaways or streams or all that kind of stuff. So first off, what is like when it comes to my music, my cover versions of songs I've recorded, um, when it comes to streams and, you know, I'll throw in sites like SoundCloud and, and in that mix, what is my responsibility as uh, an artist who wants to accurately and legal be within the law and accurately compensate those people's for their songs? What, how do I approach it when it comes to streaming? Well, when it comes to streaming, oh, so I'll tell, I'm going to distinguish between downloads and streaming when it comes to downloads. Okay. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You were, you're going to need to get the rights, um, regardless of whether you're giving away the tracks or if you are, um, you know, actually selling the tracks. Um, when it comes to streaming, there is actually, and this is not a pretty, this is not a very well-known fact. There is actually, uh, a, uh, a statutory mechanical license for, interactive streams and when I say interactive streams I mean not Pandora like think of a situation where you look at the song your user looks at the song clicks on a button plays that song that's interactive because I interacted with this and then I picked a song and I played the song when it comes to interactive streaming there is a mechanical right but um that mechanical right is you know it's it's carved out for music services you know for songs that are being streamed on, on music services and so a lot of music services actually like spotify for example um will take responsibility for clearing um the mechanical rights i.e getting getting these licenses including the license for cover songs if your song happens to be a cover song but it's a deal by deal basis of course so it really very much depends on your deal with your particular distributor so i always recommend that artists take a look cuz i we get questions about this that you take a look at your particular deal with your particular digital distribution company um because in some cases that in many cases that responsibility when it comes to streaming services um that is shifted to the streaming service. Like that's, it's covered by your RDOs and the Spotify's of the world. Uh, but sometimes it's not, it depends on the particulars of your digital distribution deal. You're to get the licenses though, regardless, I mean, li- louder licensing, we, you know, louder exists to help get the licenses that you need and that you ask us to get. So if you tell us that you want to get some streaming licenses, you know, to, to, because you're going to put your stuff up on SoundCloud, for example, um, we'll, we'll do that. But I always recommend that people look at, we always recommend that the people look at their distribution deal to see what is needed because, you know, we don't want you to get, you don't want to get, and we don't want you to get licenses that you don't need. You should get the licenses that you need and you should pay for them. So you, you mentioned people coming to you to license SoundCloud. I'm, I'm guessing that in that, uh, case that, uh, SoundCloud is not paying anything. Well, you know, if you, the terms, their terms are not a secret. It's like on their website. So, um, you know, the, the user, the artist is responsible for making sure that they have all of the rights cleared. That's how it's phrased. So, um, you know, so we're here to help when that's needed. When someone comes to you and they need to get a cover song license, is there ever going to be a case where my recording of a cover song gets rejected for a type of usage? Or are there scenarios where they can reject you? I know that, uh, you know, the law is pretty much that once a song has been released publicly, anyone can re-record it. But, you know, I'm just curious if there's scenarios where the, the publisher still has say in whether or not you can use a song in that way. Um, I know specifically speaking, like, you know, if I went to a publisher saying, Hey, I want to license this track on SoundCloud. Are they going to say, no, I don't want it on SoundCloud. Or do they have that authority if I'm willing to pay? Um, you know, if a song is eligible for licensing under the copyright law as a cover song, as a, under mechanical, the statutory mechanical licensing, if the song is eligible for that, the publisher cannot prevent you from getting that right. Cause it's, it's set forth in the copyright law. But the question is whether or not it's eligible. So if, for example, 
example, you were to record a cover of this awesome video game, this awesome track from a video game soundtrack, okay? And that video game soundtrack was released by the, by the game publisher on a compilation CD in 1993 in Japan, okay? Then you would not be eligible for um, a statutory license. That being said, we do actually have direct deals with a lot of music publishers. We work directly with them because music publishers, you know, covers can be really fantastic for them and they do want to support that and the independent artists that actually take the time to go through the proper channels and get the rights. And so we do work directly with a lot of music publishers to get the rights. Um, and sometimes, you know, we're able to get rights that maybe might not be available if you were to just go through a statutory license. So in, in your example of a, a compilation album being released in Japan only, I would not necessarily be granted that right because it was not a U.S. release and therefore it's not covered by U.S. copyright law? Exactly. Right. How, how does that play in with, let's say, the U.K.? Because I know there's tons of bands that are from the UK that are popular here and their works are copyrighted in the UK. Is there some sort of agreement between those two territories or is it? It's not so much, um, you know, it's not so much uh, the copy, the applicable copyright law, but rather whether or not something was released here. So if something was released here, okay. you know, for purposes of getting a US statutory mechanical license, if something was released here, and when I say here, that can be very broad, right? Because Nowadays, with the internet, all you have to do is just put it up on iTunes throughout the you know throughout the world, and then yeah. that's it's been released okay. for all intents and purposes everywhere, right? Yeah. So if 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 it, if someone has put it out voluntarily, not like bootlegs or something, if if somebody has voluntarily put it out in the U.S., you know, as either as a as a digital download or um, as a physical CD or other kind of physical release, like a single, if you will, I like that <laughs> word a lot. Um, then the statutory right will be there. So, but what, either way, like, you know, what, in terms of when we work with artists, um, you know, artists will, we have a platform. So artists will basically submit their, their, their cover song, um, license request, and then it gets processed. So this, this actual, like the research and the, the, the matching, the, the track identification, all of this, this happens behind the scenes so that it's, it's pretty straightforward trying to make it as simple as possible yeah. for artists. Which, which we appreciate. And I think that's one of the big things that for many, many years, it was such a challenge for independent artists. Oh, God, e yes. And, and folks like Harry Fox Agency, who was for the longest time, basically the only place you could go to, was not interested really in working with indies or doing it yeah. in a way that was at, at the level of uh, affordability for them. So uh, now that we've come to full circle and louder exists and it's affordable and simple, it's definitely important that artists do this. But what 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 could possibly happen to me if I don't license my cover song? Is is really anyone going to notice? Um, if you don't license your cover song, the track can, the track can very well possibly be taken down. It is possible and. If you ever want to do something with your cover song, if you ever want to, for example, try to get it licensed for film and television, which is like a whole other conversation, I know. But, um, you know, it, it, not having secured the mechanical license can sometimes throw a wrinkle, wrinkle in those plans. So at the end of the day, I mean, it's your track could be taken down at any time. You know, it, it could really jeopardize um, your account status with a distributor like CD Baby. Um, and it's a liability at the end of the day, that liability is being shifted. Usually if you read the fine print of most platforms and, you know, services that you work with, like that liability is being shifted to you, the artist, you, the artist are usually responsible for getting the rights. So if there's a problem and someone tries to go after a platform, you could be liable and you, you, you don't want that, especially if you're really serious about your music, you know, and you've got, and you really start your music, it really starts to take off. So I've seen some really awesome, in the past years, really awesome cover songs that are actually some of my favorite music of all time that are not available at all. Like they've been yanked. Even like from, I'm not going to name any names, but from some major label artists that actually like just went off and did a cover song on the side <laughs> without their label knowing. And then it was, it was an awesome cover. It was so good. And then it's just like, 
now I can't even find it. I have to like find it on some bootleg site. It's definitely not going to be available because, you know, because they didn't get the license. And then subsequently, like, because they failed to get the license initially, the publisher, you know, has the ability to just say, well, sorry, you're never going to get the license. So you're just not going to be able to distribute this. You just can't do it. And that's unfortunate. So I, I would hate for any artist to be in that position. So um, get the license. Make, it, make a good faith effort at least. So you're saying that uh, if, if, I, if I release a cover song and I didn't do uh, my, my due diligence and secure a license ahead of time, even if I had all the intentions of doing it, I just got lazy and didn't do it and the album came out anyway... If if I get in trouble with the publisher, they can pretty much revoke my right on that that song going forward. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they can they can deny you from being able to to get the license in the future. So I think that's a pretty key point for artists because uh, one thing that uh, we've always said here at CD Baby, and I think YouTube is a, a perfect testament of that, is that a cover song can be a great way for you to reach new fans and actually get noticed, you know, and, and, and people, it's an easy way to draw people into your music. And it would be awful to have some cover song just getting spread or spread around on yeah. YouTube, getting some great viral momentum and then getting yanked because they found out that you hadn't done any licensing to get it done. You know, things that don't sell very well do get yanked sometimes, but a lot of times it's when the momentum is really starting to build and success is starting to come to you. And, and, you know, people are talking about your track, people are, are playing it, people are sharing it. Um, and that is great, but that is a lot of times that's, and that's what you want to have happen. But then that is when someone might notice that you perhaps have not secured the rights. Yeah. And you don't have to have an explosive, viral hit for some, some some of the stuff to come up on people's radar these days. I mean, I've seen artists with, you know, they've got a cover song that has 100,000 uh, views and they, they're like calling us up, oh crap, I, they're telling me they're going to pull it if I don't get this licensed. <laughs> and it's, so it's not like you have to have millions and millions of views to pop up on people's radar these days. There's so many different ways that, uh, uh, you know, little um, software that searches these things out and kind of brings them to someone's attention somewhere. You mentioned uh, it can affect your your licensing opportunities as well for TV and film. I can I used to pitch for CD Baby to uh, oh, use for me to music. That's why I was curious when you were doing uh, oh doing music supervision. I was like, I wonder if Annie was someone I was spamming oh, constantly. <laughs> <trying>. <laughs> oh, I want to add something actually. Like, you know, if you are a, you know someone that has worked as a music supervisor, I have definitely spent a lot of time on iTunes. And would have on Spotify had Spotify been a really big platform at the time that I was music supervising. But yes, on iTunes, searching for versions of like What a Wonderful World or like, you know, Right Here, Right Now, and Van Halen. Like, you know, like there are certain songs that just get licensed over and over. And sometimes you just want a different version of it. Or sometimes you just cannot afford to license the original or are not able to license the original. Yeah. And for independent artists, that is a really good way to get your foot in the door with sync licensing. And of course, when you have already been placed, you've already been licensed for an established television show or like a film that establishes your credibility and it increases the likelihood of future licensing. So, you know, I was on a really great panel at South by Southwest um, that had an artist uh, called Digital Daggers on it. And they, they are an artist that basically records these crazy, I guess, dark wave is the best way to describe it. These crazy chill wave, dark wave um, cover versions of various pop songs. And they get licensed like crazy for television. And one tip that they had was that you can actually, um, if you actually have the cover songs, what you can do is you can actually try to figure out who owns the songs and, you know, the music publishers that own the songs Music, if it's an established music publisher, they're going to have a team of people or at least one person whose full-time job it is to find various versions of the songs that they own and then send them to music supervisors. So if you've already got this really great cover or this really great set of covers, it would probably behoove you to have those music publishers be aware of your existence and be getting the stuff out there for you because it's in their interest because if it gets placed 
and your song, your recording gets licensed, well, they're going to have to be paid as well. They're going to get a license as well um, for the publishing side of things. And of course, in order for that to happen, publishers like to know that you have gone and made the goodwill effort to license the cover song if you've if you've released it. So uh, it's something to keep in mind. That is a good tip because uh, what I was wanting to say about uh that when I was pitching at CD Baby, uh, one of the placements I got was, it, it was a jazz standard. It wasn't in the mood. It was something similar to that. I just can't remember what it was. Um, and I pulled together, I had like eight different versions I found yep. of that that people were doing on CD Baby. So that's a good tip to, to reach out to the publisher and go, hey, this is the version. If you get any requests for a big band or whatever, in, independent one that's a little cheaper to, to, to license on the uh, master recording side than like some famous uh, jazz person. But it's not even just cheaper. It's like sometimes yeah. it's just better. Like yeah. Sometimes it's like, you know what? We need a female vocal for the scene. Or like, you know, we need a female vocal for this brand. Like it has to sound, you know, the original is just dated. Yeah. You know? Wait, yeah. What, was the, what was the television or what was the film? It was, it was a Macy's commercial. And so the, yeah. the interesting thing was, yeah, I, I should say, yeah, not necessarily cheaper. You're right. But like uh, various versions, you know, cause they, they, uh, they wanted a certain feel and, and they wanted a, a big band feel and, and some of the, the old school labels that own a lot of that stuff aren't very into licensing sometimes. But the one thing that almost held up the deal was that the version of the song they did, which was the most popular one, the, and you know, they read it from charts. It was like, you know, we're talking music that was actually printed that people would play from, actually quoted a different song in the middle and they didn't realize it. And so we had to scramble last minute to secure that license and work with the publishers uh, because they hadn't been paying uh, the the mechanicals on those sales. And, oh, and, okay. and so yeah. we just had to kind of uh, tie up some loose ends and mm-hmm. uh, in order to, to make the sync thing go through. And, and fortunately everyone yeah. was, was uh, wanting to make it happen, but that that's, you, you don't could, want to be at the late stages of about being about to be like, have your song in the target back to school campaign. And that, you know, which is, of course, that's just going to be a six figure deal. And you're, you don't want for that deal to suddenly drop because someone was upset that you didn't get the cover song licenses. Yeah. You don't want that to happen. And somebody could do that to you. So it's, it's, uh, it it was interesting to see that happen. And also not, not even, sometimes the publisher could be total, totally happy to make it happen. But if you're talking TV and their deadlines are like, usually within 24 hours, they may have to pass just because there's not time to get the deal done. Right, uh, right. The timelines are really tight for sure. So yeah, so there's definitely a, uh, a negative outcome if you don't properly license cover songs that could come up unexpectedly and then uh, no one's mad at you. You're not getting fined or sued or going to jail, but you might miss out on some opportunities that are unfortunate. Yeah, cover song licensing today is just the kinds of tools that are available to artists today are just incredible. I when I was doing music, um, you know, when I was you know fully doing music and touring and all that stuff, um, I I never released any cover songs. I never did because at the time I didn't know how, and it, it seemed really daunting, and it seemed really expensive, and I was intimidated, even though. I did cover songs, you know, like sometimes I would cover her <laughs> pavement or like Radiohead at my shows. Um, <laughs> but I never recorded any covers and it would have been nice to have been able to do that. But I, it just seemed daunting. Yeah. Um, so let's, well, why don't we, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about specifics about how much it costs to, to license a cover song through Louder, some of the tools you guys have and, and uh, what they can do at your site. Yeah. Um, an artist uh, can come to Louder and get a cover song license um, or multiple cover song licenses, as it were. And the cost uh, in terms of the service, the cost of the licensing service is a flat $15 per track. Um, we have discounts if you are licensing a lot of songs. And you can go to louder.fm slash licensing go go to the pricing page which will have details about the the bulk discounts but basically it's it's a flat fifteen dollars per song um and what that what that fifteen dollars 
gets you is, you know, all the research, the song identification, you know, going and getting the licenses from the publisher or publishers, as it frequently is the case that multiple parties own shares of a single song. Um, and then, you know, taking the royal, taking your royalties and, and paying them out to the publishers and making, making sure the payment gets to the right place. So that's, that's what, that's what we do. Um, the service fee is $15. Um, and then the royalties are going to be very much dependent on what your distribution strategy is. So it's going to be, you know, you're going to be looking at, you know, 9.1 cents per track per download for each cover song. So if you had 10, you would just multiply 9.1 cents by 10. If you had 100, multiply by 100 and so forth. Um, and if you had stream, if you wanted to pre-purchase interactive streams, um, the rate is one cent per stream. In that scenario, like if I was going to go license what I, my activity on SoundCloud, I would pay one cent per stream. Right. But you would prepay it. Pre-pay. So what you would do is you would you would get a buffer and you would estimate what that buffer, you know, what you want your buffer to be, whether it's like a thousand streams or a hundred streams, 10,000 streams. I don't know. It just depends on what your plans are. And then, um, and then you get that. If you, at some point, you know, and in terms of like downloads and sales, you know, I know CD baby as, as a, as a CD current CD baby artist, actually, um, I know that CD baby has some really fantastic tools for tracking what your sales are, um, what you've sold in terms of downloads or like actual physical CD sales. Yes. You can actually buy my physical CD on CD baby. It's amazing. <laughs> but anyway, you can track, you can track that. And so if you track that, then you keep track and you figure out like, well, you know, I've purchased like a thousand units basically for my CD or I've purchased a thousand digital download licenses and let me deduct against that. And when you, when you run out, um, you do need to come, you do need to get a license. Um, you need to go and purchase additional units, but you can do that at louder. And we actually, there, there's like a really great discount if you've already secured a license and you're just coming back to get additional pay additional royalties. Do you have a strategy that you recommend for artists on the digital download side? I mean, cause I know that you have to pay in advance, mm-hmm. uh, at least you're supposed to, if you're, if you've already started selling, you can still go and license that. But, uh, if you're supposed to start in advance and make an estimate, what if I'm, you know, feeling very ambitious about my new release? I say, ah, I estimate I'm going to sell 10,000 copies and I sell a thousand and it's looking like I'm not going to hit that 10,000 copy prepayment I made. Can I get a refund? You can't, you cannot get a refund. So what I recommend is that you purchase an amount that, you know, is reasonable, you know, as is a reasonable estimation of success. And it's like, you know, if you sell that many copies, right, it's like not too, too high, but it's like reasonable. And if you sell that many copies, then you will be at the point where you can afford to go back and purchase additional licenses or pay, you know, pay for additional copies because you'll be in that position. And that's a good problem to have. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You want to come up short as opposed to like way overshoot. <laughs> well, you can overshoot too. Yeah. I mean, like overshooting is better. You don't want to like, what you don't want is to just grievously underpay and then run out. Right. That's what you don't want. So, yeah. you know, an estimate. And then if you're coming up to, you know, if you get to the point where you're coming up near the point where you think where you're going to, you know, exhaust um, the royalties that you've already paid, then you go back and get some more. Does that make sense? Yeah. Basically, if you're re- releasing cover songs and doing it on a, a regular basis, that uh, you're just going to have to, you know, be a little bit more proactive and paying attention to how much you've paid for, how much you've sold, and, and kind of justifying those two balances and making sure you don't owe more money or be prepared to start paying for more money for more right. downloads. So, right. Um, well, uh, do you have any uh, final thoughts about cover songs, cover song licensing? Anything that uh, we haven't covered that artists should know? I know we'll put some links to the Louder site where they can um, go check it out. And I definitely encourage folks that uh, um, the great thing about services like you is it it, it makes cover song licensing not a scary thing, but a, a thing that can be a real boost to your career. And I like that idea that you mentioned about contacting the publisher and letting them know you've done those cover songs. That's a good idea. 
Yeah. I'm going to do, do it. that. Do I'm it gonna... in, yeah. Do it in a non-obtrusive way. That, that, that's my tip. I'm just going to show up at their office and hand them a CD. That's how I'm going to do it. <laughs> you say that, and I actually... <laughs> and I'm going to say, <laughs> Annie, from, Annie from Louder yeah. told me to come here and give this to you. I have so many stories from when I was like doing indie music, and I got to tell you that, like, let's just say once I showed up on the doorstep of like an, the owner of an Austin record label, because that was the address that I found, and I didn't realize it was his house. It was like Saturday morning. <laughs> I was like in town for a show and I had like a press kit in like a folder with like a CD and I was really earnest and he came out like in his bathrobe and it was really awkward. Anyway, um, don't do that. <laughs> I have so many crazy stories like that, but yeah, don't, don't do that. It's not the way to go. Um, if, if it's possible, because nobody likes to say no to the person that actually created the music. If you can find a way to have a neutral third party, whether it be Kevin at CD Baby or somebody else be pitching your stuff for you, that's you're like you're always more likely to get a response because, like I said, nobody likes to say no to the artist. Nobody likes to say, you know what, this music is not very good, or you know what, this is just not going to work. Nobody mm-hmm. likes to do that. Um, I do have an additional note regarding cover song licensing. Um, it's a note about um, public domain music, actually. So if you cover something that is truly and definitely in the public domain, which means that it is, you know, the copyright term has lapsed and it's no longer protected by copyright. Um, You don't actually need to get a cover song license unless, and there was, this is the, this is the little, little known part. um, Unless the song that your, your cover is actually not, is a cover of an arrangement of a public domain song. So, um, you know, for example, there is this Christmas, there is a uh, Ukrainian Bells Christmas song that is in the public domain. But then there's this crazy prog rock version that is frequently used in Christmas light shows that is an arrangement of that public domain song. And that arrangement is copyrighted. So if it is the crazy prog rock i think it's a trans-siberian orchestra it's that crazy prog yes. rock version of ukrainian bells that you are covering and it sounds more like that yeah you need to get a license so that's just a, a note that i wanted to put out there because um it's, it's good to know and then also um public domain just tread lightly if something is if something was written around 1923 but not like severely before it or like ex- a long time before it, the closer you get to that date, the more you want to be careful. Public domain law is its own like practice. There's like some attorneys whose full job it is to figure out whether or not something is public domain. So, uh, you, you mentioned this and I'm curious because, uh, I've released two Christmas albums and we, and we, we, we were certain that all the songs we did were very much in the public domain and they were our arrangements. But now that we have these, arrangements you're saying we could go copyright these arrangements yes yes if you if i mean yeah if your arrangement uh i mean the the standard under copyright law is that it needs to have enough like creativity to merit a copyright yeah but you know yeah it's that sounds like a whole nother whole nother topic that but i'm, I'm very yeah. I, is there is there a, some more resources online i could look that up um you you know, it's interesting, but this is a separate conversation for later. But, you know, I think we can, we'd like to work with CDB to put together some resources that yeah. maybe you guys share with your artists. Yeah. That, so we can talk about that a yeah, that, later that, on. Yeah, that'd be a good one because a lot of people contact us saying, I did this really cool arrangement and it's kind of like, well, what determines, uh, it's, a, it's just, you know, a variation of the public domain to something that's available to be copywritten as a new arrangement, but... By the way, if you arrange a song that is not in the public domain, i.e. it is protected by copyright, you don't own that arrangement. Correct, yes. Right. The, the person that owns the copyright owns that arrangement, actually. We'll put links to Louder and and uh, and all that. And you guys are just at louder.fm, and that's where people can go to license their cover songs. Unless you have any other final final words, I, I think I think we're we're good. My my brain's full on copy or on uh, cover song <laughs> licensing. <laughs> I just want to say, I do want to say this. So many years ago, when I was on tour, so 
we had these really friendly C- emails from CD Baby, and they were, you know, you guys had such great emails, and they were always so friendly, and they were always like, well, let us know if you're going to be in Portland. So I, ever the liter- literalist, decided to just email you guys. I emailed your support team when I was coming through Portland because I had a show booked at this place called the Mount Tabor Theater, and um, I needed a place to crash. So you guys, res- you guys actually... I mean, this, I think this is before you were with the company, but yeah, like you guys actually what year was circulated that? it. It was a long time ago. It was, it was Derek Siever's time. Anyway, like you guys actually circulate, cause I saw the email chain. You guys actually circulated it within the office. And then Derek, your CEO at the time actually said, yeah, sure. <laughs> you can crash on my house. So we told, like, we actually totally crashed at his house and drank all of his beer. And that is my favorite CD baby story. That's funny. Ever. I might have so. been here at that time. I've been here since 2006, so I don't know if it was before then or, or what. But uh, yeah, it was it was it was before then. But oh, yeah, okay. It's um, that's my favorite CD baby story. That's funny. So, you guys are you guys are doing good work out there, in Portland. Uh, it's good stuff. If if, if we, the offer still stands, if people are passing through Portland and they need a place to crash, we'll circulate around the office. You might get something. Yeah, really? That's wonderful. I was going to say, I don't want to like suddenly open up the floodgates or something and have like everybody suddenly hit your support line with uh, couch surfing requests. We, we just need to build a bunkhouse here at CD Baby and let artists that are passing through stay there for free. That would be amazing. You guys have the space up there in Portland. Do it. <laughs> I'll put it on the list. Put it on, put the, it list. on the list. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Annie. And um, we'll, we'll definitely uh, be talking more with you guys and getting more resources from the Louder team about cover song licensing and other legal issues. And and uh, we'll have to have you back in the future. I t- I'm, I'm, you, you, you kind of got fired up when I said fair use. So I, I, f- I feel like that might be an interesting topic for the next time we have you on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, definitely. For sure. <laughs> so, well, thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, thanks for being on the show. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the podcast. Again, thanks to Annie for uh, being on the show. If you want to license some tracks and take care of those cover songs, head over to louder.fm. That's louder.fm. And I think Annie said it was louder.fm slash licensing will take you right to the part where you need to get to to start licensing your music. So be sure to do that. Take care of your business. We'll put a link in the show notes for the podcast. Also, you can call us at 360-524-2209 or you can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com send us your feedback your comments if you have any experiences of uh, having success doing cover music doing a cover song or um, multiple songs I'd love to hear about it it's always interesting to see how that helps artists build a fan base so send us that uh, those uh, stories and we'll get them on the podcast So we'll catch you next time. Bye. You've been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 